This is a Browning model of 1917A1. It's a 30 caliber, belt fed, water cooled machine gun. Well, actually, not this one. See, I got this one as a cut parts kit in about 2011. It had been demilitarized. For those of you who don't know what that term means, it means is the military uh, is through with a, a firearm used to, particularly full automatic weapons. Uh, some of them could be demilled and sold as parts kits. The ATF has an exhaustive list of the controlled parts or the regulated parts of guns and uh, how they have to be handled. And this particular gun, the right side plate, is a regulated item. In order for it to be uh, put into the civilian market, the entire right side plate had to be removed, it had to be cut up uh, with torches, very specific and detailed instructions by the ATF on how it has to be removed, where the cuts have to be made, and how much material uh, must be lost in the process. The remainder of the gun can then be sold as spare parts for those people who wish to maintain or repair their registered NFA machine guns or for people like myself to use uh, to construct or fabricate legal semi-automatic versions of the machine gun in its former glory. Um, that's done by one, taking the, uh, the bolt and the sear slot for the full automatic sear has to be machined to receive a semi-automatic only sear. That semi-automatic sear is much larger than an original full auto sear. So when you machine the bolt for that to fit, a uh, full auto sear will never fit again. It'll just fall out. It is, uh, the hole is, the slot is much too large. You also have to modify uh, the outside of the bolt, the barrel extension and the lock frame to fit uh, past the new uh, semi-automatic right side plate, which through the center has a much thicker profile. It's called a denial island. That way, full automatic parts will never be able to fit in here again. You also have to buy a semi-automatic trigger. Uh, they're available commercially. So uh, it looks cool, but uh, it's a semi-automatic version. Squeeze the trigger, you get one shot per pull of the trigger. Uh, it is still belt fed. So uh, I say all of that for you to know that during this video and any future videos that I may make concerning this particular firearm, it is legally not a machine gun, and it uh, and it never will be. It's a it's a Title One transferable, just like any other semi-automatic uh, firearm through a 4473 transfer, and they're legal to own for the general public as long as you can pass a background check, and it's legal to own in the state that you live in. So it is not a machine gun. I have no intentions of loading or firing in this video. There's plenty of videos on YouTube showing how to. Uh, to load and fire uh, 1970A1s and their impressive rate of fire. What there are not many videos of on YouTube are some of the accessories and the peripheral items that go along with owning a 30 caliber belt fed. So uh, rather than making a very long and exhaustive video, I thought that I would uh, break it up into, into sections. And so today uh, we're gonna just talk about the water cooling feature and the accessories that go along with it, namely the hoses or the cans, uh, the chest and things of that nature. And, uh, and we'll, see, we'll see how that turns out. So hang with me and, uh, and we'll talk about some of the accessories that go with a water-cooled machine gun uh, that you, you may not get to see elsewhere. It's important to know how the gun itself is cooled by water. We'll start briefly uh, by discussing the water jacket. Here's a photo of a cutaway version uh, from a museum and you'll be able to see in that uh, the steam tube in the top. In this illustration we can see a cross section of the jacket with the barrel in the bottom. There's also a tube running along the inside of the top of the jacket as well. That is a steam collection tube. As the gun fires the barrel heats up from a combination of the burning powder, which is propelling the projectile, and the friction of the projectile itself going down the barrel. 
the cyclical rate of fire for a 1917A1 is 400 to 600 rounds a minute, depending on how it is timed and head space, uh, along with a few other external factors that, that may change that. The rate of fire generates a tremendous amount of heat in the barrel, and having that barrel submerged in the water keeps the barrel relatively cool. Well, relatively as in a few hundred degrees and not red hot and melting. The heat is transferred to the water, which begins to heat up, and in some instances, it even may boil. The water jacket is not an entirely closed system, but it does build some pressure. The steam escapes through two holes in the steam tube on the top of the jacket and travels out through the steam channel molded into the bronze end cap. You can see here uh, in this photo the inside of the end cap. A steam hose or steam condensing vise as it is known is attached there. So I took the internal steam tube out of the gun which went in that hole right there in the front of the uh, end cap. So this is the tube that runs through the top of the water jacket. You'll see there's a hole here and a hole here. This is what collects the steam and then runs it out through this hole down through that steam condensing device or the hose. What I thought was really interesting about this as I was learning about the gun years ago, it has this sleeve. And so you move the gun around, you point it down and you hear the sleeve move. You point it up, you hear the sleeve move. That's an interesting um, method of preventing the gun from pumping the water out of the hose into the can. <clears throat> if you're using it for anti-aircraft fire and you're pointing up, then all the water has run to the bottom end of your water jacket. And so the steam would then go out this hole rather than pressurizing the can or the, uh, the water jacket and pushing your water out. Also, if you're firing downhill, it slides forward to keep the water from just running out of your gun and then the steam is collected up here. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty ingenious design by Browning, uh, I think. As the 1917A1 was based off of the earlier World War I uh, design for 1917, very little changed about the gun, a few minor external features, um, bottom plate, such as that. The tripod did change quite a bit from the World War I version to the, to the World War II or the 1917A1 version. What didn't change a whole lot were the accessories. So now that we have a pretty good understanding of the, the water cooling, the water jacket, we can take a look at the hose. Uh, hoses are very simple. One end is uh, tapered and it has uh, spring-loaded jaws that clamp on to the uh, attachment point on the other side of the gun right here. And so it, it actually just clips in place. And it's got a fairly, uh, fairly robust connection. The hoses didn't change a whole lot from the time they were made all the way through the 60s. Now it is important to note that when the hose was not in place, that you needed to put the cork into the steam vent opening here or the condensing device attachment point and so that the water does not run out of your jacket if you point it down this helps keep some of the water uh, in the jacket so this is called a uh, just a cork assembly but other than that the hose clamps right on hoses didn't change a whole lot what did change was the water cans. Now there are three basic versions of the water chest, I should say, and um, I don't have the top one. So collectors refer to them as top one or generation one or series one or uh, style one. I just basically refer to them as, as top one, top two, top three. 
I don't have a top one uh, water chest, so I'll insert some some photos of those now. Earliest known chest were known um, militarily or colloquially as chest, comma, water, comma, M1. They were made from 1917 until, a, until the late 1930s. Those cans are fairly hard to come by. I've, I've never actually seen one in person. They're, they're kind of like hen's teeth. They're hard to find. They had what many consider design flaw, and that the bottom of the chest had no lip or ridge around the bottom. And the, the water drain cap and plug just kind of stuck off the end. It made it not very easy to sit upright and is often shown simply propped against the leg of the tripod or even laid on its side. Keep in mind, there didn't have to be a whole lot of water in these things for them to recondense the steam. So as long as you got a few inches, you're okay. You don't have to have it, gallons of water in it. They can be easily identified by the oval recessed top in the can where the handle and filler cap reside, as well as that awkward drain and filler cap on the bottom. I don't own one of these uh, early top one cans, <clears throat> thus the photos. However, I would really love to add one to my collection eventually. The next type of water chest is known as chest, comma, water, comma, M1. These were made from the late 30s uh, until late World War II. So this is more than likely the uh, water chest that was saw service through most of World War II. Had a couple of design improvements over that early uh, style one can, the top one can. It has a lip around the bottom now so that the drain plug on the bottom and the cap aren't just sticking out like a sore thumb and you can actually stand it up. It won't have to fall over. Also, they did away with uh, all of that pressed oval top that had to be done by you know, dies and presses. And instead, this is all just a pressed and welded um, lid with the bronze uh, quick release uh, handle and cap. So they do make reproductions of this particular can. Uh, this one's original and uh, I bought it online and had it shipped in from the Netherlands. Uh, this is the one that I display mostly with the gun. So as this part of the cap here is made out of bronze or brass, um, that was much needed for the war effort and other materials. So to further simplify the design and to save material for the war effort, the military switched over to the top three uh, water can or water chest, which is known as chest water M1A1 and the one there about went right off the side. So they further simplified things a little bit by putting a canvas handle on the top you notice they did away with all that fancy bronze and brass and just made a plain stamped metal um, sheet metal lid or, or uh, cap. Now there are two versions of this. There was one that actually had a leather handle, but it don't rate its own series or top. It was just depending on whether they had leather handles or uh, the canvas webbing handles. Most of them that you see are canvas. <clears throat> it retains a lot of the same features, still has the lip around the bottom and the drain and the cap where it can stand up. Um, I actually bought this one new old stock. It was still in the wrapped in the brown paper. Uh, it came out of a crate of four and I was really excited to get this. Never had water in it. Uh, it's original paint, original stenciling, and it normally stays wrapped up, bubble wrapped and in a box. And I only bring it out for special occasions, Christmas, you know, just kidding. When we do uh, displays or whatever for World War II, but it don't go to the reenactments and, uh, and to the field with me. This is, that's original paint. I'm right proud of this one. So we can't talk about the water-cooled machine gun without talking about the ubiquitous Every collector's got one. Uh, if you've got a water-cooled machine gun, 
World War I, World War II era, particularly a brownie, you've got to have one of these gigantic canteens. So there's a lot of mystery around these canteens. It's a big boy. It holds a lot of water. Probably, I'd guess to make probably three or three gallons, or two and a half, three gallons anyway. Um, you see these in a lot of collections of people with machine guns. However, try as I might, I can't find one single solitary documented evidence that they were ever issued with the machine gun. They're not in any SNL list. They're not in any equipment list. They're not in any manual, and I own several manuals. Um, you don't, they're just not in there. But we know they were used because there are photographs, so I hear. I've never seen one of those photographs, and I've looked pretty hard. <clears throat> I did spend some time even looking for the the hand carts, the M3A4 hand carts from World War II that had the machine gun attachment on it to see if I could find one strapped to one of those. Can't find an original photograph. Uh, if you know of one, please share. I'd love to see it. What we do know is that they were made probably prior to World War I. When I got this uh, canteen in 2018, I posed a question over on 1919a4.com forum. It's a great website if you're into belt feds about those. And uh, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of years of knowledge and experience on that website from people who know far more than I do. The general consensus is that it was a general service canteen prior to and leading up to World War I. Um, it was used primarily as a squad canteen but also take into consideration that during World War I, the machine guns were on big wooden machine gun carts, and it had two guns or three guns sometimes, or it had the gun, the spare barrels, tripods, all the ammunition, and they were pulled by a mule. Depends on what kind of configuration cart you had. And uh, there's a lot of evidence that these were actually used to water the animals to keep the animals in uh, in water the mules because if the mule went down then that made soldiers have to haul all that weight um then there's a lot of speculation because we do know they were used there's lots of uh oral histories and, uh, and again they say there's photographs but i haven't found them um of soldiers who realized that hey this thing's got a strap on it and so i can i can hang this off of my side and that frees up my hands to carry more ammunition or a, or a gun or firearm of some uh, kind rather than tying up your hand carrying this guy. So um, soldiers are known to do field expedient things and uh, we do find a lot of these ca uh, canteens and they're referred to as 1917A1 machine gun canteens. But if there's documentation out there, I can't find it. So uh, there you go. If you stuck with me this long, then apparently you are interested in uh, the Browning 1917A1 and uh, would possibly like to see other accessories that go along with this. I do plan on uh, maybe next week or sometimes discussing the different types of ammo boxes that went with this. And eventually we will get to uh, some of the peripheral things like uh, the tools, the spare parts, uh, the spare parts rolls, the canvas, and, uh, and we'll talk about some of the indirect fire components that come along with this. And uh, we'll split it up over several videos if it's something that you're interested in. But thank you for your time. I look forward to seeing you again. Uh, God bless you.